Follow comedian Derek Richards on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe to his YouTube channel and watch all episodes of the podcast. Now grab a drink and join your host, Derek Richards. What's a drink with Derek? Derek Richards here in uh, Las Vegas. Thank you so much for... uh, tuning in here huge thanks to uh my friends over at new takes tv uh drew ben rob and sean doing a fantastic job putting this thing together can't uh thank you guys enough everything looks absolutely spectacular um also big thanks to uh my sponsor vegassportsadvantage.com if you're gonna bet sports you need to go ahead and use your head when you're gambling we all know you have a favorite team you can't just bet the team that you like if you want to win some money, these guys make their clients money. I made some money off of the uh, NBA game. Uh, what was it? The Portland Trailblazers game uh, the other night. These guys know what they're doing. VegasSportsAdvantage.com. They uh, go to their website. The record's right on there. You can see exactly what they win, what they lose. They're insanely transparent. They are absolutely crushing it in college football right now. They are the number one sports handicapper in college football right now. Vegas Sports advantage.com also uh if you get a chance check out my album double down you can snag that wherever you go ahead and download all your uh all your happy stuff you filthy animals double down is available on uh, itunes spotify as well as uh, amazon and uh also excited to plug for the uh special that i'm in with the irish comedy tour which is available on amazon prime myself mike mccarthy Derek keene damon Leibert. Go on Amazon Prime, all the platforms you can see in the bottom. You can get it on Dish, DirecTV, Vudu, uh, iTunes. But if you have Amazon Prime, it is absolutely free. The Irish Comedy Tour. All right. My uh, guest today, super excited to have this guy on. He's a, a good friend of mine. He is uh, based here in uh, Las Vegas. He's an accomplished screenwriter, award-winning songwriter, and comedic actor. Uh, probably best known for his caustic observations and musical satires of his live comedy performances. Early in his career, check this out, Rodney Dangerfield made him his protege, and together they toured the United States and Canada for over three years. I love that picture. Dennis also uh, conceived and co-wrote Rodney's hit movie, Easy Money, and also played a couple of cameo roles. He had hooked up with uh, Joan Rivers and Tom Jones for extended tours until a three-month engagement opening for George Carlin turned into a 20-year tour as George's exclusive opening act. You've seen Dennis on the uh, Tonight Show several times. He's got a couple CDs. He's got a one-man play that he put together. But uh, let's check him out right now. Dennis Blair, comedian here on A Drink With Derek. There is a disease terrible that strikes 10 out of 1 Americans, 15 every minute. Vocal dyslexia, it's called. An ailment I've been lifing all my fight. It can warn without striking and has no regard for case, reed, or cruller. The symptoms? Speechal garb. Backs coming out wordwards. And an inability to center complete puttins together. The victims? Innocent people like Moo and P. Sadly, vocal dyslexia is wilding like spread fire. And there is no curpal simp. But there is hope. The Dyslexia Foundation recommends these things three. Third. At the first trub of Sinal, physician consultant. Second. Stay in bed and drink Flutie of Plentids. And first, read as can as you much. With help yours stamp out disease, we can this terrible. For more information, write 555 Teen Fifth Street, Grand Missage Rapigan. Thank you, Much Iver. That was Dennis Blair, ladies and gentlemen. Very funny job. Thank you very much, Dennis. Free beer for everyone! Ozzy Osbourne, come on! Ozzy Osbourne, who 
once said, and I quote, How was the Ozzy Osbourne talking to Bob Dylan? Wouldn't you? I, I would kill for that. good to see you always good to see yeah your video stuff i had not seen the uh vocal dyslexia thing before and uh by the way we just got uh, contacted by the dyslexia foundation of america mm -hmm. and they have uh they've canceled right. you so i hope you're happy right people at netflix just walked out on me which is weird you know because chappelle's <laughs> having enough troubles and i'm not even on netflix so so you know, all of a sudden dennis blair's name crossed the radar at netflix yeah, yeah. All the they're dyslexic Netflix people are watching at your Netflix. podcast. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're pissed. Everyone's pissed at me now. The people who Everyone's like the people pissed like at the everybody. PGs. I know. I know. Done. I'm pissed at you. To tell you the truth, for running uh, large, large women trying to cram into jeans. They're pissed <laughs> at you now. Hope everyone, you're happy, everyone, Dennis I've, Blair. I, Dennis Blair. How you doing, you, my friend? How you doing? Good. How are you? Same you know, here. I got to tell you this. I don't know if you had, uh, if you've Googled your name. But the first name that pops up for a Dennis Blair says, mm -hmm. uh, Dennis Blair, former United States Director of National Intelligence and is a retired United States Navy Admiral. Yeah, that's right. That's you? Oh, okay, cool. I'm glad you decided no, yeah, to throw that knows. career away. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, well, no, see, no, it was, it was too stable. It was too stable. So, you know, who needs that crap? Who wants, no, I'm a different who guy. Who wants, who, wants, who wants government benefits and, no, six, and a six-figure salary? No, exactly. who needs that aggravation? Good to see you, my I friend. Agree. How you been? Always. I've been okay. I've been, uh, you know, I've been living, which is weird. I thought by now it would be over, but, um, you know, now You took the I'm under on here, yourself? So. I you did. went to the sports book I, and took the under on yourself? I did. I lost money on my own death. <laughs> I was, welcome. I welcome was to betting against me. Thank you. <laughs> You are, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with you before. I've seen uh, yes. your stand up multiple times. I've seen your actual, you're just, you're just singing. Uh, 
on, on, yeah. on multiple occasions too over at uh, bootlegger and uh you do uh, uh-huh. we're doing shows over at the tuscany as well this is before the world uh, ended that's right now that's are you right. back are and, you uh, back uh are you back working at the uh what, what's your gigs now that you're normally doing besides comedy well besides well that's well nothing's changed <laughs> at all you know my Nothing. life is a big static mess no i still work over at the tuscany on fridays with the kenny davidson band unless i have another gig which happens every once in a while and then you know i've been doing a lot of uh, you know the comedy cellar here in town and uh we just got back from reno where our old stomping grounds so um you know and now uh I'm looking forward to do, and I have two shows in, uh, that I'm producing coming up in the in next month. So I'm a busy beaver. You know what I'm saying? You got stuff going on, my friend. You were a, well. You were a musician before you got into doing comedy. Correct. I was. What was your? I still. What am. was the? Why, <laughs> what? How did you transfer? <laughs> how, how did you transfer from working in bands to to doing stand up? Well, uh, here's the big story that I tell. You know, I was working in bars as the, you know, the bar guy uh, singing songs, James Taylor songs and Paul Simon songs. This was in Long Island. And as you know, you know, no one listens to you in a bar. They're all talking. And I got very offended by that because I was on stage and I was pouring my heart out. And these people were just talking. So during the intermission, I went up and I said, I'm going to get their attention. And I wrote this parody of the then popular BG song, Staying Alive. And I, my parody was singing too high. And I came back down to that stage and I, I sang two or three regular songs. And then I threw in the parody and people started listening. And they said things like, hey, those aren't the real words, real smart stuff like that. And then they started <laughs> laughing. And I, and I said, I said, hey, that, that I might have something here. And then I came up with more parodies. And then I started doing requests and try to come up with parodies on the spot. And from there, I developed a little comedy act, totally accidentally. Went to Dangerfields uh, the following week, auditioned, and they it went really well. And then they hired me for the next week to open for Jackie Mason. And that's how the whole stupid thing started. From one audition at Dangerfields. You yes. got. You ended up that, getting selected to open for Jackie Mason. Correct. Wow. It was one of those late night things. They didn't have me on till like one o'clock in the morning, and I don't know. People were tired, and they were. I guess they saw too many singers in a row or something like that. And I came on with my stupid little thing that I was doing, and uh, yeah. And they said, "Hey, I, we, you're really funny. You want to open for Jackie next week?" And then as I'm opening for Jackie, uh, uh, some one of the shows, Rodney come. Rodney uh, Dangerfield comes wandering in. And he comes in at the end of my show, sees people laughing, and he goes, they obviously know what you, know what you, like what you do. What do you do? And I told him what I did, and he stayed and watched the next show, and then he started liking me. So I started opening for him. The whole thing is a complete accident, and I apologize to everyone for it. <laughs> you had, do you have any idea how envious people are of, of, of you having that immediate level of success in, in getting the attention of a, a legend i mean uh, arguably i mean and we'll get to your experience with george carlin but i mean you spent time working with rodney and george carlin i mean you could easily put those two two guys on the mount rushmore of comedy correct yes uh yes i am aware of how envious people are and uh i am envious of me which uh go, goes to my schizophrenic nature i hate myself <laughs> so um I look at myself and I go, that bastard doesn't deserve what happened to him. And there, and I'm right. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Just, <laughs> you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't write that stuff. You know, it's like what I'm doing. I'm in a bar. I'm singing in a bar, and like three months later, I'm like touring with Rodney Dangerfield for three thousand people at a shot. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Did you even think at the time when Rodney asked you to go on the road exactly the magnitude of that? Or were you just, how old oh. were you at the time? Let's see, 24 or something like that? Yeah, oh yeah, because he had just he had just done Caddyshack. So when I started working with him at his club, you know, it was like, you know, maybe 60 people a night or something like that. It wasn't always full. Weekends it was full. Then Caddyshack hit and he became the biggest star in comedy. I mean, my timing was perfect as opposed to my act. But um, he became a huge <laughs> star. And, and all of a sudden, he couldn't play his own club anymore, so he starts doing, you know, 3,000-seat theaters and takes me with him. I totally went, oh, I can't believe this is happening to me. So, yeah, I certainly was aware 
of all of that stuff. What was it like working with Rodney? Because I know he had some quirkiness. You and I had talked about this before when we were working together, and you had shared so many great, funny, funny stories about Rodney. The one that right. I want you to tell, though, for sure, is mm -hmm. the, the hot tub story. <laughs> well, this is how I got fired. <laughs> I've, been fired for... <laughs> I've been fired by some of the biggest stars in the world. <laughs> so I'm with Rodney for like three, oh, a little over three years by this point, we're touring. And uh, Rodney lived in Westport, Connecticut. I lived in Port Jefferson, which was a ferry ride across the uh, across the, the, the the river there, whatever that body of water thing is. And he would always call me and say, hey, come on over, we'll do some writing. And you couldn't say no to Rodney. That was one of his quirkinesses. Like, you know, I'd say, well, Rodney, uh, I have a party at my house in 10 minutes and oh, come on over anyway. And you couldn't, you had to drop everything and go over. All right, fine. So we went over. At one point, I said to him, Rodney, can we bring our dog? Because our dog at the time, Daisy, was like our child, you know? And he says, yeah, just don't make sure she doesn't go swimming in my pool. And I'm thinking, okay, I wasn't intending on bringing my dog in his pool, but what does that matter? Anyway, we bring the dog over. So we're doing some writing. Rodney decides to go take a nap. I'm with my then girlfriend, now wife, Peggy. Uh, he says, don't bring the dog in the pool. He goes to take a nap. We go into the pool for a while. We go into his little hot tub. And the dog climbs up on the hot tub, goes to lick our faces, falls into the hot tub at the exact moment that Rodney wakes up and sees the, <laughs> the wet, drenched dog. I tried to run out of there and put him in the garage because I knew he would think that we brought the dog swimming. I couldn't, the, the garage was locked. I come back, he's yelling at Peggy going, you brought the dog in my pool. Now I'm going to have to drain the whole pool and clean all this dog here. It was a poodle. It doesn't shed. And we're trying to tell him that. And we're trying to... And we're trying to tell him, no, it fell in, it fell in. We weren't, we didn't, he did not believe us. And that was the beginning of the end. He, and here's the, here's the weird part. Uh, we had to stay over because the last ferry had left. So instead of like getting out of there and going, Rodney's pissed, let's just leave. We had to sleep over that night in one of his <laughs> guest rooms. We wake up the next morning and he's called everyone saying, I called all my friends. I told them what horrible people you are. And I'm going, Jesus Christ, we left right away. So that was the beginning of the end. He never got over the dog story. And the dog, we really should have had the dog put to death and told us and, and, and held it up for him to see. See, Rodney, this is how much we love you. This was Daisy. <laughs> the dog, the dog that fell into your hot tub. Jeez. Did that ever get patched up at all? I mean, did he ever talk to you afterwards or or was it one of those? Because I've heard stories too that, um, and I, I again, I'm a huge Rodney Dangerfield fan. Right. And I'm not speaking ill of the uh, of the deceased, but I mean, he uh -huh. he was known to hold a grudge. Well, yeah. Well, his, his one of his grudges was if he if he saw a comic that he thought was stealing from him, he would never forgive that comic. That's what he thought about David Brenner. And I'm looking, I'm, I, he said, yeah, Brenner, man, he stole a couple of my bits. And I, I never saw Brenner doing anything of Rodney. And the same with Joan. He hated Joan Rivers because he was convinced that she stole. And as it turns out, I worked with her <laughs> like yeah, a few years later. And she did one-liners like him, but she never did any of his jokes. And you couldn't right. you couldn't reason with Rodney. You couldn't like go, no, but no, I watched her, Rodney. She's not, no, man, she's a thief. So he, ha he had that kind of grudge holding. So the thing with me with the dog was the first step. The second step was I get a call from Joan Rivers' people. I'm still working with Rodney after the dog incident. He didn't fire me okay. right away, but he was still pissed. I'm, I get a call from Joan Rivers' people. They say, hey, we heard good things about you. You want to do 10 nights with Joan? I said, I don't think I can because Rodney really hates her, but I'll tell him, you know. So I, the next day I called him, yeah, Rodney, yeah, Joan Rivers people called and I, I turned it down. And he goes, no, man, you know, you got to do it. She, she's, she, she guest hosts The Tonight Show. Maybe she'll put you on The Tonight Show. And I go, seriously, really? You mean that? He goes, yeah, no, no, I wouldn't hold you back. So I signed a contract for 10 nights. Two days later, Rodney goes, you know, I was thinking about it. I don't want you to work with her. And I, I signed a contract oh, with her. It starts tomorrow. He goes, no, nah, I don't want you to. So I had to go. And, you know, those two incidents, the dog thing and the Joan Rivers thing, led to him eventually. Uh, New Year's Eve at the, uh, oh, what was the name of the theater in Florida, in Fort Lauderdale, big 3,000-seat theater. Um, right before I went out, he said, uh, by the way, I think you and I should part ways. And I went out. I was supposed to do 30 minutes. I, uh, I went out there. I was doing my show. I started getting dizzy. I, I came off after 20 minutes, came off stage, immediately threw up, and that was it.
I was done with Rodney, but I started with Joan. So that's how that happened. I have had a really weird life, Derek. Wow. <laughs> What? Uh, well, tell me about Joan Rivers because you ended up then bouncing and doing uh, and working with uh, working with Joan, who I think is hilarious. I mean, I thought she yeah. was absolutely brilliant. I saw her. It's got to be now, maybe thirteen. It was got to be twelve, thirteen years ago. She was with Don Rickles in West okay. Palm Beach, yep. and I saw her. Mm -hmm. And she she went up first, and the Rickles went up second. She absolutely crushed. I mean, right. so damn mm -hmm. funny i mean and right. then i had a chance to i had a chance to meet her after after her set and she could not be could not have been nicer just the sweetest right. person yeah yeah you know, I, she was, I mean uh, and, she was... and obviously that, that's me seeing her as a you know as a patron as a customer but i mean sure. how was she off off stage behind behind uh behind the scenes when when you're working with her because everybody has a different relationship when they're working with somebody Sure. Well, she was, you know, after the trauma of working with Rodney, I, you know, I was gun shy. I was, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be near any of these celebrities because they all turn on you eventually, you know, uh, that seemed anyway, it seemed at the time. So anyway, you know, I was very careful. Um, the first night uh, she walks, it was, it was a, a, a big club in Boston, a big theater in Boston, uh, the Chateau de Ville, it was called. And she walks in with Edgar, her then husband, and Gary Shandling, who was her other opening act. Joan always used at that time in the mid 80s. She used two opening acts. God knows why she wanted to do a shorter show or something. Um, anyway, so I met Gary and her and they seemed nice enough. And I did my show. And luckily, it went really well. And, and uh, Joan goes, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll see you tomorrow, whatever it was. And uh, are we allowed? Are we allowed to? Is there, are there language restrictions on this podcast? No, there is not. <laughs> no, sir. So Edgar comes up to me and very friendly goes, all right, Blair, good, you didn't fuck up. You know, he walks off. So it's like we've known each other for years. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, no, what have I gotten myself into now? You know, and Ga Gary was, you know, a little distant at first, but we got to be really close. Um, but she personally was like, she was like a den mother. Like we would do Tahoe for a week. And, you know, I sleep until noon at least. I get a phone call in uh, at like 10 in the morning. It's Joan. Uh, hello? We're going on the boat. Go downstairs in about 20 minutes. We're meeting in the lobby. What, uh, I'm going, boat? What are you talking about? She had commandeered the uh, then, it was then Caesars in Lake Tahoe, the, the yacht, and she demanded that they use it. And she brought me and her entourage. And I think Gary, that first time, on, we went water skiing at like 11 in the morning. It was, you know, she was like, so she was like, you know, getting a group together, like a scout scout leader. Come on, we're all going here. We're all going there. You know, she's very personable, very funny off stage. And uh, yeah, and she, and she was she was great to work with. And then she, she used her clout to get me on my first Tonight Show, which I'll never uh, forget, you know. So that that was that story. What was that experience? Your first Tonight Show. The Tonight Show. We're talking. Uh, so now we're talking Carson. Carson or Leno? the Carson era? Yeah, Car okay. Carson era before Leno. Yeah, pre Leno. When she was the when she was the guest host, uh, occasionally to fill in for Johnny. Tonight Show, and eh, no big deal. Let's move on. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah, the yeah the Tonight Show, Johnny yeah, right. Car the Johnny yeah. Carson era of the Tonight Show, which is uh, hands down. I remember watching that when my grandparents would let me stay up late when I would stay at their house. And right. mm -hmm. that's how I got into Carson because my grandparents would, you know, they could care less. I mean, I'd eat ice cream at, you know, 11 o'clock at night. We'd watch Johnny Carson and they sure, were just, sure. and they would laugh. They'd laugh their ass off again. It's grandma and grandpa. They don't give a shit. You know, they're right. here's, here's ice cream. Stay up as late as you want. We love you. Of it's, course. It's, there's no yeah. restrictions here. That and, had there was, and this was pre-cable. Well, and this was pre-cable too. So it was like, uh, you know, it was like there, we had like five channels or seven channels or whatever. So everyone watched that show. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. So that was like, you know, when they finally, I, I always had trouble doing TV because of my, the nature of my act, which was parodies and they didn't want to pay for song rights and stuff like that. Right. But I was able to cobble together a set with, you know, non-parody and, and, and have some stand-up you know, monologue in there. So, uh but she fought for me. The, the the then talent coordinator, Jim McCauley, was like, he'd seen me once at the comedy store. He said, yeah, you're very funny, but you can't do parodies on TV. And I thought that was it, you know. Uh, but she just fought for me somehow. She was like, really, because she had that kind of clout. And finally, uh, she said, yeah, you got it. I went, oh, Jesus. So that day was like, you know, I went to all the clubs and put a set together and for a month and, and worked on it. And that night it was like, uh, 
I I was nervous the day before. The day of, for some reason, I don't know. I was I relaxed. It was like I don't know right. why I'm going. Why am I not nervous? Why am I not nervous? I should be nervous. <laughs> Trying to psych myself into messing up my entire set, but it didn't work that time. Um, <laughs> so, and it, and it's like you know you go out. Oh, I did a rehearsal, a sound check on the stage, standing on the spot that Johnny stood on, which was ridiculously amazing. And then I did this, I did, you know, I ran through my five minute spot and the, the Ed Shaughnessy, who was the drummer, came over and he said, hey, you're going to have a good set. That was really funny. I said, thanks. And then this director came over. I thought it was Carson. It was, I guess it was his, his brother directed the show at that time. It was like, this guy comes up to me. He looks just like Johnny. And he go, okay, stand over there. Johnny. Oh, it's not. Anyway, all this stuff was happening. The show went really well, I think, because I had no memory because I was like on a different spatial plane at that particular time. I sat down with her and we spoke for a minute or two. And then I went, I don't remember, I drove home that night. I don't remember how I got home because I was like, I was in an altered state. It was amazing. So yeah, it was a great experience. I did another one maybe six months later and that went well too. And then they said Johnny was gonna be on next time I was doing it. And that's when he fired Joan because he didn't tell her that she was doing her own talk show. So I, that's, that's my second fun firing story. <laughs> oh, wow. That's yeah. right. I forgot about that. I had read that in, uh, in Carson's, uh, in the book about Johnny. Right, right, right. So he's pissed at her. I was now a Joan act. So they told me I was, I was going to do my next shot with Johnny and that never happened, but it's okay. Oh. You know, and I've gotten over it. I've gotten over it. I'm going to go kill myself now. What is mind. the? Tell me about the uh, the the play that you put together. It was your one man musical comedy entitled uh -huh. "Also Appearing" about the ups and downs Correct. of your career as an opening act. Was it basically you talking about these experiences here, where you where you don't know the uh, the temperature and the attitude of dealing of working with these celebrities, not knowing yes. how long your how long your job security is is intact. Yeah, uh, that that was the era about was that night the nineties or something where like everyone was doing a one man show. My mother was doing a, a one man show, and she was just a house as a man. So yes, she had a little fake mustache and everything. She looked uh, great, so by the way. I thought it was a great show, you know, especially the part where she wore the skirt. Um, I didn't I see that part. Meant. I must have gone to the bathroom. <laughs> yes, you. I'm must. an idiot. Anyway, my then manager, who was also was also Carlin's manager says, Hey, you know what you should do? You should do a one man show. And I go, okay, what should it be about? He goes, I don't know. So I had to come up with a one man show. <laughs> it's the same reason I did the book, by the way, he says, Hey, you know what? I didn't come to your one man show, but you know what you should do? You should write a book. I said, what should I write a book about? He goes, I don't know. So I wrote a book about what the one man show was. Yeah. It was about all the people uh, that I opened for and funny, funny, funny road stories. And I tried to do different characters and I had original music that went with it. It was uh, you know, pertaining to the story, wherever I was in the storyline. Uh, I had, right. uh, I, I did Woody Allen narrating the story. Uh, basically I would put the glasses on. I'm going, this guy, you know, you think I'm weird. This guy is, you know, I'm glad I'm not him. There was a song in the show called, at least I'm not Dennis Blair, where Woody Allen would uh, go on about how he's insecure <laughs> and how he has all, and how he doesn't get along with women. But the chorus would be, but at least I'm not Dennis Blair. So it was a cute little thing. We ran for three nights in LA and it went very well. And then my manager at the time didn't do anything with it. So, you know, once again, once again, you can see how I became world famous. <laughs> what was the, uh, so the title of the book is, what was it also, also uh, called also appearing? The, the, the original title of the book was called Me First. It was because I figured I'm an opening act, you know, Me First. Right. Uh, also appearing. Of, but then people would say they weren't crazy about the name. So I said, why don't I just call it Touring with Legends, which it's about, you know. So that's what Now, I, can people still get that book now? Can they get it on, uh, oh, on God, Amazon? Yes. Or? It's, it's, okay. It's on the Amazon. Yes. It's on the Amazon. A, everything's they, on the Amazon. It's on the, everything's on the Amazon and also at bearmannermedia.com, which is the publisher bear manner. There it is. Media. Look at it. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Look at you right there on the you cover. Got, you got Those are some, there. you, you have some fantastic pictures. I want to pull up some of these pictures that you had sent over and yeah. see if you can recall these, uh, these moments in your, in your career. This is, uh, now when was this taken? Okay. I'm not seeing the pictures because we're, we're, your video is about 10 seconds. Behind the the audio, okay. Now I see. Okay, the I see the cover. 
So you'll just, you'll actually there have to go. tell me what picture you're showing. Okay, gotcha. This cover. is with you and Rodney right now. Yeah. Well, that when was that? That was backstage. I think at Caesars in Atlantic City or Resorts International Atlantic City. Is that the one with my hand on his leg? Yes. 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 With one. that seductive yes. look on oh. your face, and you're holding a glass of wine. <laughs> yes, I am. Uh, you should see the next picture. Anyway, you have a very, it led to a, a very coquettish, <laughs> very coquettish look about you. That's kind of my look. <laughs> And, and I remember that picture Rodney, here. Rod, yes, go ahead. Yes, that's go ahead, Jackie Mason. That's, yes. a, that's Jackie Mason. Uh, I, that was a recent visit to New York. Every time we went to New York, which is usually once a year, except when the COVID hit, uh, just to hang out and see plays and stuff like that, um, we'd, we'd visit Jackie because it would like be, it's like you'd always have a story because he was so incredibly funny. It's like at, at lunch, he just, you know. He's just hilarious. Uh, and you'd have these stories, you know, about, uh, he, he was describing the one, my favorite story that he told me once, because, you know, he had this great career going with one man shows on Broadway. Oh, yeah. And I'm going, yeah. So I'm going, tell me about that, Jackie. Was that fun or was it, he goes, I hated it. He says, the guy, the director tells me you can't just go up there and tell a joke. You have to go up there. You have to have, you have, to have scenery. You have to walk around. You can't just stand in the middle and just tell a joke. So he's directing me. He says, okay, you you tell three jokes next to a lamppost. And then you walk over here and you say, tell five more jokes next to a sofa. And then you go over there. You go, you tell three jokes next to a third of a staircase. <laughs> I fell out. I fell out of my chair when he said a third of a staircase because I know exactly what he means. You know the oh, exactly, yeah, in, uh, in in theater, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, right. You sit on a but, third of a staircase. A third of a staircase. Who else could come up with that? He was so funny. So we would visit him every year. And you know, he, he died like about three months ago, and uh, that was terrible. But uh, we had so we had funny, some great such laughs. a such a such a brilliant man what's the uh let's see the next picture that we have here that you had sent over this oh. is oh you and norm mcdonald it's like i'm starting to feel guilty because everyone i open for dies i mean is it me is it something i do is it something that i said i don't understand this, this yeah i don't want to go up on uh, stage after you to be honest with you no no i would yeah, i would refuse any offers to work with me if i were you I'm surprised after you are Rito, the, you're, you're the standing. black cloud of people, to be honest. <laughs> I really, I really am. Uh, this was like uh, two years ago before COVID, and it was at the South Point in Las Vegas. And uh, the music, the uh, entertainment director said, hey, you want to open for Norm this weekend? She said, yeah. I, I said, I don't know if he remembers me. Because <laughs> my, uh, my one great story with Norm is 1980s. The improv in L.A. I wasn't living in L.A. yet, but I visited there a lot. And they put a, an impromptu softball team together, and it was the it was the improv versus the comedy store. And I said to them, "Listen, put me in the outfield because I suck. I can't play. I'm a terrible. I'm not an athlete." And they all said, "No, we're just going to have fun. We don't care who wins. It's just a fun thing." They put me at second base, which was a complete oh, mistake. that's horrible. Norm, I know Norm McDonald's is is at first base. First inning, guy hits a line shot right to me. And I just watch as it goes into the, I didn't even go for it. It was, it was in the outfield. <laughs> <laughs> people, people, now all these people who said, ah, oh, we're just having fun. They're going, what you let it go for? You idiot. You let it. That was, we could have got a it an easy out. And I'm going, I took, and they're all yelling at me. As they're all yelling at me, Norm comes lope. Norm comes loping over from first base and very calmly goes, and hey, I Paula, I went right past you there. I said, I know. I told him not to put me here. But it was just he had this stupid grin on his face. Like, yeah, bye. He just, he just let it go right by. That's nice. <laughs> no, I, no I, never, I never heard a negative story after his passing, which everybody was completely blown away by that. The fact that he had a nine-month yeah, right. battle with cancer and didn't say a thing to anybody about it is nine is years. Nine, nine years. Nine years? Oh, that's right. Nine years. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So when that's I was even more jaw-dropping. He was doing it. I know, I know. I guess he just didn't want people to feel sorry for him. But you know, I didn't know him very well. But he remembered me right away from that, from that foot, from that game. And you know, I'm always amazed when anybody remembers who I am. So, uh, and we had a, we had a, again, he was hilarious. You know. Oh, he's he's absolutely brilliant. What's the? Uh, let's see, yeah. and another another picture that's uh, up here. Oh, you and uh, Robert Klein. 
Robert Klein, yeah, who's one of, I, I remember opening for him, I think at Dangerfields years ago, and this was just to visit him backstage. He did a show at the South Point, and uh, again, I, I called, I, you, could, you know, you figure all these stars, you know, they want, they screen their calls. You know, I called up the South Point, and you know, my wife goes, I call Robert, see if, see if you can go to the show. And I call him up, I guess, uh, Robert Klein's room, and I figure they're going to say, oh, uh, he's, he's screening his call. And they go, hold on. <laughs> I didn't even, didn't even tell him who I was. You know? He goes, oh, hi, Robert. It's Dennis Blair. You remember me? Dennis, how you been? So we just had a great conversation, and uh, I saw his show, which was fantastic, and we hung out backstage for a little while, and that was this. That's great. What's, uh, let's see, what, we have any, uh, okay, this is the, let's see. Oh, uh, this is that's, the, uh, that's, an upcoming event. Veterans. that's an upcoming event that you have, uh, yes. right yeah, around that's... the corner here, Sun City McDonald Ranch. This is you. Yeah, I'll look uh, at you with your, uh, your happy smiling mug. And then, uh, Michelle uh, Roll and Andrew uh, Freeman. What is the, uh, what is the story behind this event that you have coming up? Well, this is a music event. This is how I'm starting to produce these shows in town. Uh, we did this show, we did a Simon and Garfunkel tribute about three years ago for the first time here. Uh, we put it together. There's a producer in town that I know, and she, she knows I do music as well as comedy, and said, uh, could you put, we have an over 55 community here, would you put a uh, show together, a Simon and Garfunkel show? And I did, and it went really well. We did it again the following year, and uh, they wanted to do that again this year. Then we did a Crosby, Stills, and Nash, uh, Joni Mitchell, um, James Taylor show, which also went. So these shows I'm starting to produce are, are really catching on and they're they, they're big hits with you know, that demographic so this is just something they put together they want me to host and i kind of put the show together for veterans vietnam veterans uh at mcdonald ranch which is like 10 minutes from my house so that's perfect in a, in a little theater there and it's just going to be songs from the 60s and 70s in that era so that's that's that andrew freeman is a really great guitar player he was in a show called raiding the rock vault and he's an amazing guitar oh player yeah and singer and Mich yeah 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 and michelle does a fantastic uh, Janice Joplin in person, not impersonation. She just sings the songs, but, uh, right. Plus we have a full band. So that's, that's what this is just an upcoming show. Oh, super cool. Let's see. Uh, what's the other picture we have here coming up? Uh, let's see. This is, oh, uh, okay. Oh, here my we album go. This was, yes. <laughs> yes. This, this is the actual studio that in Nashville that where I recorded this album and I, I it's, it, for the people who get it, you know, music from big, big pink is the first band album. So I copied the font. And put music from wow. Big Brink and Big Big Brink in the house <laughs> that I recorded this music in. But, so there you go. But I'm telling you, uh, we, we started doing this in 2015. Me and my songwriting partner, uh, who have gotten together after 30 years, we went to grammar school together, and uh, he found this studio. And they get you give them a guitar and voice demo, and you play it for them. And they have this Nashville numbering system that they put. They they do charts. They, they have, and these musicians go into the studio within like 20 minutes, you have a full blown song with pedal steel and, and drums and guitar. And it sounds unbelievably wow. great. And uh, so I'm like addicted to doing this now. I go to Nashville one every one a year or two and uh, I was supposed to go last year, but of course we couldn't, but I'm going to go hopefully next year. And we put down so this know, is, 10 or 11 so this songs. Is the, this is the studio. This is the studio. And that's the that's album. Studio. It's got like 14 songs. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's a house. But it's a full blown studio. It, it's not used for anything else but that. And it's in. Well, it looks like a drug house. Like you can't see inside. Well, All the windows are closed. Well, that's, like, and I know that's obviously yeah. you get, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. You don't want that stuff <laughs> sitting out there for right, idiots but, but, to see and break in. But, uh, right. But let me but explain yeah, that, 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 that looks like a, That looks like a studio <laughs> slash meth lab. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and it really it's amazing how loose you become during the session after you go into the uh, the drug part because uh, the section's <laughs> in the back and you take your meth okay, and you take your drugs and then it's just the sessions are so laid back it's just really nice you know it really helps the music you know I've heard that I haven't uh, I have personally yeah. not been one to indulge in uh, in meth or other uh, opiates or narcotics but uh, but I'm gonna take your word for it. I'm going to okay, trust good, you. Good, good. Let me bring uh, Dennis and back now, here on the screen. Now I'll be sued. I'll be sued by them now. <laughs> we don't do drugs here. The hell you damn Yankee. Come down you, here and uh... give you a nice record. <laughs> and you, you, let that, you let that idiot co-host talk about, talk about our place as a, as a drug house. 
no i, I mean i can't no imagine left. some of the incredible stuff that's uh that's come out of there and i mean and you've got some oh yeah great uh some great musical stuff that i that i that i've heard before before we get into talking about your musical stuff i do want to talk about your uh run-ins with that guy that uh some people in the comedy business may or may not have heard of called um what's his name george carlin oh him yeah, yeah. kind he of uh yeah, he's, you know, you know, I think if he kept at it, he could really do something. He he never really so. cracked that open mic scene. Right. He was very lazy, too. It was never right. Never wrote anything new. It was always the same jokes over and over the one liners. OK, now all the now the Carlin estate will be coming after me. <laughs> Here we go. So I'm trying to think of all the people that we've pissed off so far. So far, it's your studio, the dyslexics. <laughs> The uh, yeah, right, uh, five hundred exactly. pound women putting trying to put on jeans, and now the uh, uh-huh. now the George Carlin estate. How did this Dave Chappelle feel sorry for me? Yes, um, Chappelle. Chappelle, well, Chappelle is actually trying. Chappelle is trying to cancel you right now as well. <laughs> he that's said, how, how bad dare he put these people there. He's <laughs> like, you know what? How dare Blair one up me? One up me exactly. So here's what happened with George. So through my stuff with jo- with, uh, with with uh, Rodney and Joan, I acquired an agent at William Morris, and he would, uh, you know, when I wasn't working on the road with 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 Joan or Rodney, um, he would book me with different, you know, the headliners, and you know, you want he call up and go, you want to work with the, the Four Tops in Atlantic City for a week, and I go, yeah, that'd be great, and you want to work with um, the Righteous Brothers, and you know, stuff like that. So I was I was constantly busy, which was great. Um, and his name is Fred Suss. And then one day in 1988, he calls me and says, hey, do you want to open for George Carlin for three months? And I say, let me think it over. Yes. And that was that. And um, and just out of the blue, I, they must have seen a tape of me or something on, the, on right. maybe The Tonight Show. I don't know. Um, so two weeks later, I'm standing out. Uh, I'm pacing around my dressing room in, in Omaha, Nebraska, about to do a... Uh, my first of uh, three months, three months tour with George Carlin. I'm going, geez. And now I'm pacing going, I hope he's not an asshole, you know, because some of these people, you know, you meet them and they're just horrible people. All these celebrities, you know, not many, thank God, 95% are really wonderful, but every once in a while. And then, you know, and going by his act with all the anger coming out that I had seen, I'd never met the guy really before. I'm going, right. I hope he's okay. He comes down and he goes, Dennis, where the fuck are you? Like, I've never met the guy. Dennis, where the fuck are you? He comes into my dressing room. Hi, I'm George. I go, I know. And he takes, like, everything off of my deli tray, which they had put out for me, and says, what are these, carrots? What are you, a fucking goat? I'm going to take about 100 of these, and uh, there's nothing you can do about it. I'm going, okay, that's fine, George. And we're just going back and forth, and it's like I'd known the guy for, like, <laughs> 10 years or something. <laughs> and he goes, and he goes, all right, we're going to be watching you, so don't fuck up. I'm going, I'm going to try not to, George. And he leaves, and I go, well, that went kind of well. I enjoyed that. So obviously, he's not the angry on stage guy. He, you know, he's just goofy backstage. Luckily, the show went really well, and uh, we continued the tour. It was three months, <coughs> and after three months, he said, uh, "So you want to stay?" And I said, "Well, I have no plans, so I'll just stay on the <laughs> tour. If that's okay with you." And uh, that's that's what happened. 18, 18 to twenty years later, it was you know until the, till the day he died when I killed yet another headliner in my long litany of of dead celebrities that I've opened for. Um, it was it was we we had the t- the long long run. What was it like working with him, being on the road with him? And I mean, did you at the time could you grasp the the legend status that he was, or did you just go? Yeah, it's George, whatever. I mean, I, <laughs> no, he I never... was already insanely successful by that right. point. Oh, yeah. No, I never. I mean, at, at some point, you know, you become comfortable with the guy or the person. And you just and, you know, backstage, he just had so he was just so goofy. I mean, we, we would do impressions of Jerry Lewis. And uh, my favorite note that he left, he would leave me notes while I'm on stage. That was one of the things we did. And my, my favorite note that he left me after I come off stage, I come back to my dressing room and there's a note from George that says, Dennis, a few of us were talking and we think you need to blow more people. Your friend, George Carlin. (laughs) (laughs) That's the kind of relationship we had, you know, please Uh, tell me you kept those notes. Oh, it's in the book. It's, it's, I, I photo it's, it's one of the pictures in the book. 
Um, oh man. And we, we would take, we would be, we would do a lot of rental cars. Like he would stay in a hotel in Chicago. Like if we did Joliet and in Merrillville, Indiana, we would headquarter in Chicago and he would, we would go to the gig in a rental car, take a half an hour. And in the rental car, we had, we had so much fun. We just harm stuff. You couldn't possibly repeat even on a cable show. And we had this, he, we had these contests and we come up with these premises like, which celebrities do you think have the bushiest pubic hair? And George's George's take was George George's George's suggestion was Rhea Perlman, which makes total sense. I don't know why, but it just does. Uh, what was the other one? A uh, restaurant you never want to eat in. And I, I think I came up with something like a restaurant where you drive up and these truckers are puking over the railing. You know, it was okay. George came up with any restaurant where you go in and the waiter is taking a shit in the soup. That's another one that he came up with. <laughs> so these are the kind of good times that we had, you know, just like being stupid backstage. But, you know, once we got back to the hotel, you didn't see George. I mean, we did three weeks at a time in Bally's. Uh, and in, in in Vegas, and you never saw the guy because he was, he was up in his room, just obviously writing his next special or something. So it was perfect because I had spent too much time with Rodney, and that's how I got in trouble. You know, sooner or later, you know, something bad's going to happen. And they're celebrities, and they can fire you at will. So anyway, that's what happened there. Now I got there George any... though. I got George though. Go. I, the, the, the thing, one of our premises in the car was famous last words, and they came up with John F. Kennedy, and I said, "Why is my head whistling?" And I'm proud of that joke. I don't care if it's tasteless. <laughs> <laughs> why Damn it. is my head? Why is my head whistling? What? Yes. What if, now did did George when you guys are traveling together did he just write on his own or was he did he come up with premises and he would and you guys would be together and be in the car you're in the rental car going to a gig and he's like yeah Dennis I thought about this uh, this thing what do you think of yeah. X it was mostly no mostly his writing was done totally in private in whatever hotel room I guess we were in or I guess when he was at home. Uh, I did give him a tag or two, which I was very happy, which he used on stage and on some of the specials, which I was thrilled that he, I was able to do that. And again, <laughs> I can tell you one. Um, we were just talking, coming off the plane, we were just talking. He says, yeah, I'm working on this, uh, on these bits about classical music. And I said, you know, George, I always wondered, what if there was a classical composer who was like better than Beethoven, Mozart? Uh, Haydn combined, Be the best you've ever, the world has ever seen. But what if, unfortunately, his name was, and I paused, and George finished the thought. He said, El Canto Priccolini. And I said, yeah, what if his name was that? <laughs> <laughs> and he put it in his special. <laughs> but I came up with the premise. <laughs> El Canto Priccolini. El Canto what do, Priccolini. Uh I think we got a picture of you and uh, and and uh, Carlin here that you had sent over, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. If we can mm -hmm. uh, find that and pull it up here, as your as that's okay. being yeah. uh, sorted through and found. What do people not right. know about George? I think the main thing is how goofy he was off stage. You know, because uh, I I think you know people would probably just assume that he was like you know very you know you'd see him on shows and he'd do his bit and then he'd be very very uh, he he'd have these like Charlie Rose interviews where he'd be very. Uh, serious and all that stuff, but I'm telling you, he, he just just the go the goofiness factor uh, was was amazing was amazing to me, you know, and just very now he nah, that yeah go ahead. That's no, I was going to say because because towards the end, I mean he's I mean he was hilarious, but then towards mm -hmm. the end, I know when his health I guess was deteriorating is when he started to become a little more angry. He was suffering. And no, none of us knew it. He kept it to himself. But he became, the last two years of his life, he became kind of cranky. And he started snapping at people. And his dressing room door, which was always open, and I could come wandering in, was now closed. Uh, and we were all going, George is like, what, is he mad at everybody or something like that? And it turned out that he was, he was, according to Kelly, his daughter, his arteries were in, veins were like congealing, you know. Right. Um, he he'd had a history of heart problems. But he was pretty much over those for the, for most of the 80s and 90s. And then starting around 2006, 
I guess it started creeping up on him again. And, you know, he wound up dying of heart failure. So, but none of us knew it till the very end. Plus he had an addiction to uh, red wine and Vicodin, which again, he'd had for 20 years, but I guess he kept it hidden. Um, so, um, you yeah, know, all that stuff contributed. So, and his humor was getting darker, you know, as, as you said, uh, I'm sure that was a part of a result of it, partly a result of how he was feeling, I suppose. Uh, but oh, before God, that, yeah. man, he was just, yeah. But before that, he was the happiest guy. He loved writing. I think he loved writing more than performing. He loved coming up with stuff. Um, and, you know, just the happiest guy, just loved being on the road and, you know, enjoyed everything as opposed to Rodney, who, uh, what people don't, a lot of, everybody doesn't know about him is he was one of the unhappiest people uh, I ever met. He just was, I had he heard couldn't that. take much joy. Yeah. He couldn't take much joy in his success. It was a, what's it all mean, man? What's it all mean? And I wanted to say, it means you're extremely rich and you can do whatever you want. And I never said that. He goes, it's all bullshit, <laughs> man. You know? It's all bullshit, man. You're famous. I know Chevy Chase. I know B Belushi. I know uh, all these guys. Who gives a fuck? You know, it's like, Jesus. I, I said one more year with him, I would have killed myself. So, uh, but then again, that's what fueled his, his, his you know, the no respect sure. is real, you know? Yeah. Well, you're like, yeah, you, you got enough money. You can drain the pool and get a couple dog hairs out. Relax. <laughs> you would think no door hairs. I mean, she was never Come on. in the pool. Poor Come Daisy. On. You, see, I've, you can see I haven't gotten over that yet. <laughs> Poor Daisy. Poor you've Daisy. recorded several yeah. things. You've recorded several things musically outside of, uh, outside of comedy and yes. you know, going to Nashville and doing stuff like that. Uh, what, what's the, is there a, a theme behind what you're doing? Is it, uh, are, have you kind of bounced all over and done something with more of a, uh, it, blues? Is it country? I mean, what's the, uh, what's, what makes you happy to record? Well, here's the thing with me. I don't have a style. I, I like so much. I like so much. I like jazz. I like, you know, so my tastes run from Sinatra and, uh, Billie Holiday to, uh, I mean, I, I think Billie Eilish is great. I like, I like some of the new people, you know, um, Adele is amazing. Uh, and I have a country background because I was in a country band in college. So here's the thing. I just love writing music loves, and I don't stop whatever comes out, like whatever style it comes out in. So the first album I recorded was, as a, as a, as a, I would, you would call it a, like standards, jazz standards, but it, they're all original except for one song on there. So it's like in a Cole Porterish style. And I got to do that for nothing. The guy who owned the studio just gave me the time and I got this great trio together. And we just did jazz standards as uh, uh, through my lens, through, you know, and people seem to really like that. It's like dinner music, but it's all original. And then the next one I did, I had all these, I just got in a country mode, you know, and, uh, that was music for Big Brick, and I and uh, I went to Nashville, obviously, to do that, and that was a lot of fun too. And then I did one called uh, "Songs from Captivity," which is kind of more pop. And the one I'm working on now, which hopefully I'm doing one song a month uh, here in town. I found a great studio here, and um, hopefully I'm doing one song a month just to take my time, and hopefully it'll be out by the spring of next year. So I guess what I'm saying is I just don't edit my, you know, I, this album that's coming, going to come out, it's going to be like, I hope it's the kind of thing where you don't have to put it on shuffle because it opens up with like kind of a Billy Joel rocker. And then it has, it has the next one's kind of like a Tom Petty feel. And then the next one after that, it's kind of a more contemporary R and B. So, you know, it's kind of the album I want to just play the whole album and you get all sorts of different styles, but it's what so I, Dennis play, Blair I music. can't stop writing. So, yeah. so DennisBlairMusic.com, you can go on there and, and, uh, and snag that stuff. Also, they can get those links off of your website too, DennisBlair.com. Oh, yeah. And everything's on Spotify. All my albums are on Spotify and uh, yeah, iTunes and uh, all, that, all that good stuff. Amazon Music, now, that kind of now, thing. Now, here's what I want you to do because you are – you're wicked talented. And uh, I've seen you on stage doing comedy, seen you singing, and I shot over the lyrics to – Def Leppard's pour some sugar on me. This is yes, beautiful because because you said I said you said I'm not familiar with this song. I, I need to I need to hear it several times to get the melody. And I'm like, no, this is perfect. The fact that you have not heard the song makes it even more beautiful. So what I want to do even better. I, it's, it's, this is going to be classic. So you, since you have your you have no definitive style that you fall into, so. I want you to make this song your own. Just take a couple of verses, whatever you want to do. You've got the lyrics, the mm -hmm. Def Leppard's pour some sugar on me in front mm -hmm. of you. I hand yes, these I to do. you in the studio. I go, Dennis, here. 
give me something. So, so you want me to player. make up? Do you do you want me to use the use whatever melody I remember that actually goes with the song, or just make it completely my own? You make it completely your own, but it's got to be. Those All right, here lyrics. we go. Never done before, ladies and gentlemen. I got this seven seconds before I came on. Here we go. It's Here we true. go, Rad. Listen, red light, yellow light, green light, go. Crazy little woman in a one-man show. Mary Queen, mannequin, rhythm of love. Sweet dreams, saccharine, loosen up, loosen up. You gotta squeeze a little, squeeze a little, tease a little more. Easy operator, come a knocking on my door. Sometime, anytime, sugar me sweet. A little miss, and say sugar me. Yeah, yeah, give me a little more. Pour some sugar on me. Oh, oh, some sugar on me. Baby, 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 baby. Oh, oh, some sugar on me. Is that good enough for you? Does that, does that fit the bill? Does that do it for you? That has that got to off? get into your act. That has got to, to get, get in your act. act. That is fucking oh, okay. hysterical. Countrifying, <laughs> countrifying. Rock songs? Okay, good. Cool. We'll, we'll start with Nirvana. Def Leppard. That is... <laughs> Countrifying. There you go. There you go. That is hysterical. Then we'll, then we'll, then we'll go into heavy oh. meddling Johnny Cash, you know. Hey, you're coming. It's rolling around a bed. And I ain't seen those little times and I don't know where. Y'all do that. I'll work on everything. I'll work on it. Boy. Hey, you're coming. It's Thanks, Derek. <laughs> you're welcome. I'm here for you. <laughs> There has you got are. to be a You're time. Ready. I always love asking this story to any comedian. There's got to be a time when you bombed on stage. Can you recall the time that you bombed that you went, what am I doing here? Two. Well, two. Every, yeah, tons. Tons of them. We all have the bombing sure. stories. But the ones, that, the ones that stick out of my mind are um, some sort of, I got booked on some sort of a corporate thing. It was in a, it was in a banquet hall. And I know that my wife was sitting, I don't know what it was for, but my wife was sitting at a table with Cher. I go in, there's, there's dancing, there's a dance band. The dance band stops. Now, usually what happens, as you know, is, you know, so there's an MC and the lights will go down and there'll be a spotlight. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a comedian who's going to do some very hilarious stuff. Please welcome, blah, blah, blah. No, none of this happened. The band stopped. People were pissed off because they couldn't dance because there was the band had stopped. They just pushed me out on stage. There's no spotlight. There's the room is lit up. I'm doing comedy. No one's even listening. Uh, my biggest laugh was, "Where's the fucking band?" That was my biggest laugh. Um, let's see, uh, nothing. I'm getting nothing. There's this there's this very sweet faced security guard who stands. I don't know what but people wouldn't rush the stage and kill me. I don't know. A security guard at the foot of the stage, and he's looking up at me with this beatific smile. He must have felt so sorry for me. And you know, I'm in the request portion. I'm trying to get people to, you know, yell out your favorite singer and I'll destroy them, and no one's saying anything. So I turn to this security guard and say, Who's your favorite singer? He goes, Lionel Richie. I just did it for him. I did Lionel Richie for him. And I came off stage after 20 minutes of hell. And my wife said, Cher turned to me 10 minutes in and said, is he sure that this is what he wants to do for a living? <laughs> Cher said this? Oh, man. Cher said that to my wife, yes. Uh, the other horror story is, I don't know if you've ever done warm-up for a sitcom. I have but, not. Uh, it's... It's a it's an acquired skill. You can't just it's four hours. You're four hours on a talking to people who are watching the sitcom. They start a scene, they end the scene, then they have to do it again. They have to reset the cameras, and while they're doing all that, you have to entertain the folks. And then as soon as the as soon as the scene starts, the, they ring a bell. Even if you're in the middle of a bit, you have to just okay, let's watch this scene. You have to recap, you know. To tell them again what just happened. Uh, then uh, there's all sorts of stuff, and then things go wrong, and then they switch cameras to the next scene, and you have to stand there. Uh, so I was doing this for the George Carlin show, and he had his uh, his his sitcom, and it usually went pretty well because it went pretty fast. The producer of that show was also producer of Derek of um, of um, oh man, why am I blanking on his name? Drew Carey, the Drew Carey show. 
uh, those audiences weren't as kind. And I had one show where I started my, you know, I always start with stuff from my act. They just groaned everything. I couldn't, they just hated me. They just hated me from the very beginning. And I realized I'm going to have to be here four hours with these people. Drew came wandering out and someone in the audience yelled out, Drew, please come over here and save us. Tell some actual jokes. It was, it, and, and they never, I did like oh. contests. It was four hours of trying to get them just to, just to not hate me, you know, uh, giving away prizes and having them do trivia contests and talent show in an impromptu audience. But that was the worst, worst four hours of my life. And as the show ended, as you know, some people, <laughs> the weirdest things happen. People are flying out. And one guy comes up to me, passed me on the back and said, hey, man, you were great. That, that always cracks me up. You can be up there on stage yeah. just totally tanking it. And then people come up after yeah. the show and they go, man, that was fantastic. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Best show I've ever well, seen. Thank you. Best show I've ever Best seen. Best show I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Right. You always and, and, and obviously, we have tons silent. of those. Yes. yes. You, you, yes. You're, you remain silent and judgmental the entire time and just awkwardly stare at exactly. me. And then you come up and you go, oh, that was fantastic. I loved it. Exactly. And like, tell your face, as you know, Jackie Martin said. Oh, I swear there was God. a one month there was a one month period on the road with George, you know, and it was 18 years, but there was like a three week period where I would do okay, but it never got beyond okay. It was just like people were, okay, <laughs> where's George? <laughs> you know, it wasn't it wasn't there was never booing. And I actually called uh my wife up like in the middle of it because I think my act expired because all of a sudden I'm getting nothing. <laughs> I was convinced that like and I kept trying to write new things. And nothing, none of the new things would work. And then all of a sudden, after three weeks, everything was fine again. But that three month, three three weeks was like, what the hell's going? Am I dead? Am I, am I fired any second? But luckily, it all worked out. But man, those we all have so many stories. I think my I think act my, expired. Yeah, honey, I think my act expired. Uh, That's you, you, oh you, my god. Go on Amazon. Go on Amazon and get me uh, like some new, new jokes or something. Yeah, man. So well, weird. people need to go on Amazon. Like that. People need to go on Amazon and find your uh, find your music. Amazon, Spotify, iTunes. Find Dennis Blair's music. DennisBlair.com is his website. DennisBlairMusic.com. Also, grab the uh, book Touring with Legends. And, of course, Dennis is uh, here in Las Vegas performing at uh, the Laugh Factory quite often and also over at the uh, Comedy Cellar at the Rio here in Las Vegas. And, uh, again, I can't thank you enough for your time, my friend. Always great talking with a you. Pleasure. We've got to uh, we've got to get together in, uh, in in person and actually have the uh, that lunch that we've been talking about for the past uh, Let's I think, year Let's do and a half. that. Let's, Let's do that, do that. You All sexy right. monster. Thank you so much, well, buddy. I appreciate you. you. <laughs> pleasure. Thanks a lot. Appreciate good to, good to speak with you. That was great, man. I love it. Thanks. Dennis Blair Thanks. Thanks. here on a uh, on a drink with Derek. And uh, again, can't uh, thank everybody enough for uh, tuning in and joining me here today. Uh, again, big thanks to uh, our sponsor, VegasSportsAdvantage.com. If you're going to bet sports, bet with your brain, go ahead, take advantage of the research that these guys do on the games. Again, they are crushing it in college football right now. Also, they've won. Um, they've been doing very, very well on the uh, NHL here as well. Again, VegasSportsAdvantage.com. Find them. And they will make you some money. Also grab a copy of my album, Double Down, on iTunes. Also on uh, Amazon, wherever you go ahead and download all your uh, all your happy stuff. There you go. iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, and of course, uh, the Irish Comedy Tour special, which is available on Amazon Prime for free. Free is good. Free is always delightful. The Irish Comedy Tour on Amazon Prime. Make sure you go ahead and snag that. And for all of my tour dates personally, DerekRichards.com is my website. And uh, again, huge thanks to all the folks at uh, New Takes TV. Go ahead and sign up. Get to that. Get to the website. Sign up. There's a ton of great podcasts that are on there. Lots of great content. New Takes TV. My name's Derek Richards. Thank you so much for joining the podcast. A Drink with Derek. We will see you next time. Goodbye.